When his wife paused and looked at him, John replied, I understand. John thought that he had said I understand a lot these past days, and he was really tired of saying those words. He wondered how he and Diana, his wife, had even gotten to this point. They were married for over 22 years and had two wonderful children, both in college. They lived in a wonderful old house that Diana inherited from her grandmother. Together, they updated the house, adding a pool and a detached garage. The old house now had an open concept floor plan and a beautifully updated kitchen. He was proud of the house and thought it rivaled anything they had seen on HGTV. They also had a great beach house in Hatteras, North Carolina. He resisted making any changes to the traditional beach house he inherited, preferring to leave it as he remembered it as a child. It was the site of so many wonderful family memories. John Simon Thomas was now senior vice president of Central Logistics and enjoying the fruits of many years of hard work. Diana Anderson Thomas has also done well in her career. She was a senior account manager at the securities firm Richards & Son, having worked there for the past 20 years. He thought they had a perfect home, almost perfect children, a wonderful career, and a happy marriage, until he often said, I understand. But he knew that he didn't really understand what was happening to his life. Diana fell silent and looked at him. You understand what I'm trying to say? I understand. He hoped she didn't notice the mark he made on the piece of paper in front of him. He looked at the paper, 32 marks. In the past two days, he has said, I understand, to his wife, 32 times. It's time to end this debate. So we've finally agreed, Diana said. I'm going to step outside of our marriage once to experience this. She stopped when she saw John shaking his head. John looked Diana in the eye and replied, I will never cheat on you and I will not agree for you to cheat on me. I never cheated on you, Diana exclaimed. John continued, I am ready to forgive you for the deception you have committed up to this point. But now, that's all. I've never cheated on you, Diana answered defiantly. Yes, you cheated, at least in my opinion, and if you're honest in your thoughts, then you know it. You had lunch with him alone several times, He'd met you on bachelorettes a few times and turned those nights into actual dates. You corresponded with him extensively via text messages, especially on weekends. John paused and looked deep into her eyes, causing Diana to lower her head. He now has an upscale room booked at the Jefferson Hotel and two seats for their Sunday brunch. His intentions are obvious. You have a bold new dress hidden in the back of your closet, a Victoria's Secret bag filled with new underwear. I guess it was only for his eyes since you hid it from me. Your intentions are also obvious. John stopped and waited for an answer, which never came. He continued, I'm going to make it very simple. I'm going to make sure we both understand what's going to happen. I offer two options. This Saturday morning, I'm going to the beach house. I'll stop at the Virginia diner for breakfast and then head to the beach. I'd like you to come with me. We may spend the weekend discussing our problems and wondering if we can save our marriage. It would be nice if you returned the underwear you bought for him and picked out something for us to have fun with. John paused, trying to gauge Diana's reaction. Once again, he couldn't read her mind, something he'd never had a problem with until recently. Your other option is to continue with your plans for Saturday. Meet David Summers at the Jefferson Hotel, have a nice romantic dinner at Bookbinders, dance at the Tobacco Company, and return to the Jefferson to complete your romance. Look at me. She slowly raised her head. You can continue with your plans. You won't need my permission, because the moment I leave without you on Saturday morning, our marriage will end. Diana looked at John in shock. How did he know about their plans for the weekend? She slowly began to speak. Before she could say a word, John said, In case you were wondering, I have friends where you work. You have friends at work who worry about you. And finally, David Summers has no real friends at all. Diana paused as what John told her dawned on her. Then she tried to go on the offensive. I have been your faithful wife and partner for 22 years. No, you were a faithful wife for 21 years and 10 months. You've been cheating on me since your first lunch with David Summers. I never cheated on you, Diana pleads. 
You already had sex with him, John began to say. Diana jumped up and interrupted him. I never cheated on you. With a sadness that surprised Diana, John continued, I saw the betrayal in your eyes. Eyes that were always locked on mine when we made love. Eyes that now close, a face that turns away from my gaze in bed. How many times were you with him when we made love? John laughed sadly. We used to fantasize about a threesome with another woman or another man. I assume that you have already been able to make this fantasy come true. We've had a crowded bed for the past few months. Now I won't talk about it anymore, you understand? Diana thought that everything was not going as she had planned. She tried to gain the upper hand. John, we have a wonderful marriage. I value our relationship and your love more than anything in the world. We raised two wonderful children together. We have a great career, and if we stay the course, we can retire early and truly enjoy life and each other. I was faithful to you and ready to be by your side as a loving wife until the end of our days. I'll give you the rest of my days. I only need one day for me and one night for him, was John's quick response. Diana lowered her eyes and shook her head. She looked at John. I could just go behind your back. I could have lied to you, but I wanted to be open and honest with you. I thought that after all these years you would understand. John quickly responded again. I understand. And as for lying and going behind my back, that's exactly what you've been doing in recent months. You went on dates with him under the guise of a bachelorette party. You had an intimate dinner with him, holding hands and letting his hands roam over your body, which only I should have access to. And worst of all, you brought him into our bedroom, replacing me with thoughts of him. You allowed him to interfere with our time with hundreds of messages, not to mention sexting. Diana, I know everything, and how I found out doesn't matter. What's important is that you understand what I'm talking about. You understand? Diana simply looked at him with eyes that he no longer understood. He sighed quietly, realizing that she didn't realize what she was throwing away. John stood up and left the room. He went to their bedroom, brushed his teeth and tried to sleep, but he knew it would be difficult to sleep that night. Diana sat motionless for several minutes. Finally, she moved to the sofa, took the phone and called her friend Janice. When Janice answered, Diana said, John knows everything. He knows about David and our plans for this weekend. Janice replied, doesn't sound very good. Please tell me you're going to cancel this. Diana answered quietly, I don't know how I can. I promised David and he spent so much money on this weekend. Janice quickly replied, you made promises to John before. If you don't remember, then I remember. I was your bridesmaid. Summers can cancel everything and it won't cost him a penny. Either way, that's no reason to cheat on John. I won't cheat on John, Diana repeated again. You're cheating, Janice answered. When I talked about what George and I did, I tried to make sure you understood that I would never have done it without his permission. Besides, I told you that we chose a man together and made sure it was someone we would never see again. I told you that we did everything right, but nevertheless we still have problems that we are trying to solve. You decided to sleep with a colleague and are trying to justify it. Now Janice begged, please forget about this plan, stop dating David, get on your knees and apologize to John. Diana answered softly, but I need it. I really need to experience another man one more time in my life. David is a nice guy and women at work say he's good in bed. A good guy wouldn't sleep with a married woman, Janice said. Think about what you're risking just to become another notch on his bedpost. I won't become another notch on his bedpost. He is attentive to me. Janice wanted to scream into the phone. Don't you understand that this is even worse? I met David at our bachelorette party. He's a nice man, but he's nowhere near what John is. You must understand this, right? I understand, Diana whispered. Janice pleaded. Please think long and carefully about your decision. This will affect all the people you love for the rest of your life. Diana said quietly. I thought you would understand. I thought that you, more than anyone else, would understand why I need to do this. Janice tried to reach her friend again. Diana! 
The problem is not that I don't understand. The problem isn't that John doesn't understand. The problem isn't that your kids or your parents or your friends won't understand. The problem is that you don't understand. I beg you not to do this. Deanna answered in a decisive voice, well, John knows what I've been doing up to this point, and he didn't stop me. He won't like it, but he'll let me do it. He will understand how important this is to me. Now I need to get some sleep. After finishing the call, Janice turned to her husband, George. She didn't understand a word of what I told her. I'm so sorry I told her about our experience, George replied. I thought we agreed that this would remain strictly between us. Janice was a little confused. I needed to talk to someone about the problems we were having. I never thought that this would give her any ideas. George hugged Janice and said, I know, and I'm not angry. I must admit, I also talked to John about our problems. Janice lowered her head in obvious embarrassment. You told John, I can imagine how he reacted. Did he suggest throwing me to the curb or branding me a slut on my forehead? I thought you knew John better. He asked me a series of questions. My answers to these questions got me thinking about us. After I finished answering his questions, he told me, You two got into this together. You made this decision together. It turned out to be a big mistake, but you two did it together, and only you two can correct this mistake. As long as we continue to be together, work on our relationship together, everything will be fine. He made me realize that we were in this together, and we were both trying to solve our problems. This may be the reason why we are still married. Janice began to cry. She said quietly, This may be the reason we are married, and we may be the reason he gets divorced. George shook his head, hugging his wife. Don't blame yourself if they break up. John's right. If they don't get through this together, they don't stand a chance. Diana slipped into bed and realized that John was awake. He turned his back to her, and they both moved to opposite ends of the bed. They were separated by two feet, but the distance seemed to be measured in miles. They got up with their alarm clock and went about their morning routine without saying a single word to each other. After Diana left for work, John relaxed for a moment and checked the list in his hands. Today and Monday, he took time off from work. John walked through every room in the house, photographing each room and its contents. He cataloged the contents of each room and noted the items he wanted to keep. He copied all their wedding and family photos from the cloud onto a flash drive. He left their wedding album on the coffee table, not daring to open it. The apartments he looked at were nice, but he knew he would miss this house. He will keep all the wonderful memories, but he will miss being here. He will miss the woman he couldn't stop loving and the life they built here together. John went to meet Sandra Lewis, who came highly recommended to him. The settlement she offered was very simple and straightforward. Diana will get the house and her retirement plan. John will keep the beach house and his pension plan. He will pay off her car and all her credit cards. A portion of their investment accounts will be set aside for college tuition and $10,000 for each child as an endowment fund. Then they will split the remaining funds 50-50. John looked up at the settlement offer and simply nodded his head. Sandra said, We can submit the papers on Wednesday morning. John nodded again, stood up, shook her hand, and left the office. Sandra Lewis realized that her client had said very few words to her since he hired her for his divorce. All their communication was carried out via email. She sensed sadness and resignation in him. She sometimes wondered why she chose family law as her specialty. John headed to the bank. He opened a separate account, transferring half of the old account to his new one. He emailed the direct deposit change form to his company's HR department. Later, at home, he will change his payments to his new bank account. He then went to their investment banker. He confirmed that both of their signatures would be required for all invoices and transfers. John informed him that his lawyer, Sandra Lewis, would seize the accounts the day after Diana was served. John was disgusted by the expression of pity and concern on the faces of his longtime advisors. He realized that they were just the first of many of their acquaintances who would have the same expression on their faces when the news came out. 
The thought of having to tell his children about the divorce almost made him sick. Diana tried to avoid David Summers at work as much as possible. At lunchtime, they met at Maria's Cafe, a small restaurant that he liked to call their place. She was quiet and refused to hold his hand. John knew about their every move. She could not shake the feeling she had all day that they were being watched. David Summers paid no attention to Diana's mood. I'm excited about this weekend. Hotel check-in is at 3 p.m. Do you think we could meet a little earlier than planned? Maybe we could have a little fun in the room before we go out to dinner? I don't think so, was Diana's restrained answer. Back in the office, Diana tried to do something, but kept looking around the office. She realized that at least one, and possibly more, of her colleagues were acting as spies for John. After a couple of fruitless hours, she closed up for the day and left the office. Walking down the hallway, Diana greeted two new interns in her department. She stopped and looked back at the interns. She couldn't help but notice the distinctive Central Logistics logo on the hoodie one of them was wearing. John completed all the tasks on his list. It was 2 p.m. and he realized he hadn't eaten all day, so he decided to grab a snack. When he sat down at a table in Maria's cafe, the hostess came out and greeted him with a hug. John hugged her tightly and asked, How is Ben doing? Maria smiled. He's doing great. He made the baseball team as a rookie. He's so excited. You know James has been a great training partner this winter. Your son changed everything. Well, James is thrilled that his roommate will be on his team, John replied. Mary sat down next to John and said, They were here again for lunch today, but all was not well in paradise. Diana was very nervous, and, of course, Summers did not understand anything. He may be clueless, but he's going to sleep with her this weekend, replied a dejected John. Don't rush to give it up. She must be a special woman to have been married for so long. She realizes her mistake, and I just pray that it happens sooner rather than later, Maria replied. So, Marilyn crab cakes with broccoli? John smiled for the first time that day. Sounds perfect, and maybe a beer for a change. Surprise me with one of your pale ales. Diana returned home early and began to put her backup plan into action. She planned to cook John's favorite dinner and then try to talk to him again. It was important to her that he agreed to her one-time date. If she doesn't agree to it, she needs him to at least accept her actions. When the crab cakes were baked, she went upstairs and changed. She wanted to look good for him and then planned to meet Janice and her other friend Lisa for drinks and to discuss the big day one last time on Saturday. She took Victoria's secret clothes and bags out of her closet and walked to her car, carefully placing them in the trunk of her car. She didn't want to embarrass either John or herself by exposing them to him. John arrived home at his usual time and was surprised to smell the smell of dinner being prepared. Diana entered the living room and handed him a bottle of light beer. Please take off your jacket and tie and sit down. Dinner will be on the table in a couple of minutes. John smiled at the Maryland crab cakes and steamed broccoli she brought him. He was glad, because this was his favorite dish, but for the first time he realized that he would prefer to eat at Maria's Cafe. At this moment, he would prefer to be anywhere but at home. As they ate dinner in silence, Diana decided to try again to make him understand why she needed to do this. John, I love you and I pray that you understand why... John interrupted her. I understand. You look very good today. Are you going somewhere? Yes. I'm going to meet Janice and Lisa for a few drinks later in the evening. But I'm trying to tell you that I love you and hope for you. Yes. Yes, you hope that I understand, John said coldly. I really understand. He stopped eating and moved away from the table. Getting up, he said, I lost my appetite. As he left, he told her, you look really good for him. I guess you couldn't wait until tomorrow. When you see David Summers tonight, tell him to drop dead for me. John disappeared into the living room, and the sound of the television filled the dining room. Diana sat quietly at the table with her head in her hands. For the first time, she seriously reconsidered her actions. After a few minutes, she stood up and cleared the table. 
Now was not the time to hesitate. She needed to remain true to her feelings. She wrote to Janice, Can we meet earlier? I'm leaving in five minutes. John heard the front door open and close. He drank his beer and looked at the TV. He realized that he had been sitting there for 20 minutes and had no idea what channel he was watching. He felt sadness pressing on his chest like a huge weight that made it almost impossible for him to breathe. John pulled the box out of his coat pocket. He popped two pills into his mouth and washed them down with the rest of his beer. For the first time in his life, he took sleeping pills. He knew he wouldn't be able to sleep without help. He also knew that he would need all his strength for Saturday morning. Diana was the first to go to the bar and order a table for three. While waiting, she turned her attention to the scene in the bar. Men and women danced a dance of seduction, but to Diana, it seemed like a dance of despair and loneliness. Is this really her destiny? The appearance of friends saved me from these thoughts. Diana watched as her two friends approached the table. She noticed that they seemed tense and prepared for their attack. Lisa sat down and looked at Diana. What the hell do you think you're doing? Are you crazy? Are you going to cheat on your husband with some piece of crap from work? Are you going through menopause? Or have you started taking drugs? Or have you fallen and hit your head? This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard from anyone. And I used to think, you were one of the smartest people I know. If you go through with it, you must be the dumbest bitch I've ever met. Diana simply answered her friend, Good evening to you too, Lisa. Yes, I'm fine. But what about you? Lisa just looked at her. Diana saw the anger and pain in her eyes. Diana turned to Janice. Your turn. Janice shook her head. You know how I feel about this adventure of yours. I would say more, but I'm afraid I won't be able to be as polite as Lisa. Diana smiled sadly. You think you could swear better than Lisa? Janice answered without smiling. Well, no one can swear better than Lisa, but she left out the words bitch, fallen woman, cheater, adulterer, idiot, and perhaps the worst disappointment of all. But there's one thing I really need to tell you. I think you are planning to make the biggest mistake of your life, but I love you and will be here to help you no matter what you do. Lisa just shook her head. Damn, damn, damn. What you want to do is so wrong and so stupid, but I will be here for you too. Just so you know, I'll be saying I told you so over and over again. Diana hugged her friends. Thank you for your love. I know you can't support what I do, but it's great to know that I can count on you both after this. You both know that I don't do anything halfway. I have made a commitment, and it is time for me to bring this matter to its natural conclusion. Lisa softly pleaded. Diana, there is nothing natural about betrayal, and commitment to betrayal is the opposite of the true meaning of the word commitment. Diana sat quietly for several minutes and then stood up and said, I need to finish my business for tomorrow. I'll bring a bottle of wine. Please stay and drink for me. Diana completed her instructions and drove up to the dark house. She collected her thoughts and then sent Janice a long text message. She knew that Janice was angry with her, but she also knew that her friend would help her. She opened the trunk of her car. She realized she couldn't leave her shopping in the car overnight. Tomorrow it would be too cold to wear. She hid them in the closet in the downstairs hallway. After that, she slid into bed next to John and tried to sleep. That night, sleep did not come to Diana. Finally, at 3 a.m., she got out of bed and went downstairs. She saw the wedding album on the coffee table and thought that if John could look at their wedding album, so could she. After looking through two pages, she closed the album and began to cry. She had to make him understand. At 5 a.m., she gave up on the idea of sleep and went to the bathroom to take a shower. After her shower, she put on some V.S. lingerie and then opened her clothes bag and put on the pretty item that was in it. She pulled out the suitcase she had packed earlier and carried it to the car. She then placed the Victoria's secret bag next to her suitcase. She walked into the kitchen and wrote a short note to John. She chuckled to herself. She was leaving him a letter from dear John. She placed the note on the coffee maker, turned off the light and walked to the car, determined to finish what she started. John woke up and looked at the alarm clock. It was 6.15, and when he turned around, he realized that he was sleeping alone. The thought occurred to him that she had not waited for this evening. He pushed her towards David Summers. 
he imagined that she was lying in David Summers' bed, and this picture struck him to the core. For the first time, he overestimated himself. Should he have just let her have one night to test another man? She promised to belong only to him after that one night. Did he really lose his life's happiness because of his ego and pride? Reflecting on his plight, John realized that he would never be able to love her again if she went to David Summers. He could live with her putting her children first, because that's what a mother should do, but he could never live with her putting another man before her husband. Over the course of 22 years, they both earned each other's respect and loyalty. She expected nothing less. He wouldn't accept anything less. He hoped she was home. Maybe she was sleeping in one of the other bedrooms. John checked all the bedrooms and found no sign of her returning home that night. Entering the kitchen, he saw a note on the coffee maker. He opened the letter and read the short note. Please understand, was all she wrote. John fell back into one of the kitchen chairs and began to cry. He was afraid of this, but deep down in his soul, he still expected that she would stay, forget this crazy idea, and remain his wife. Having prepared the coffee, he went upstairs. He quickly showered and dressed, then filled a duffel bag with some clothes and went downstairs. John filled his thermos with coffee and headed to the front door. Taking one last long look at the house that was his home, he turned off the light and closed the door. The cold morning air hit his face as he walked down the steps. He had forgotten to start the car, but he thought the cold would help him wake up and perhaps snap him out of whatever days he was feeling. As he walked to his car, he realized that the engine was running. He opened the back door, and as he was putting his bag inside, he saw a suitcase and a Victoria's Secret bag in the back seat. In the passenger seat, he saw Diana sleeping in the car. He quietly closed the back door and paused, reaching for the door handle. He cried tears of joy at the sight of his wife, his love, now he knew they had a chance. John took a deep breath and opened the car door. As he got into the car, Diana stirred and looked at John. Good morning, she whispered quietly, rubbing her eyes. Good morning. After a short pause, he asked, How long have you been here? Diana looked at her watch and replied, About two hours. I couldn't sleep, and then I was worried that you would leave without me so I decided to wait in the car. I gassed up the car and bought us a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts for the road. John opened the box of donuts and said, There are only seven donuts here. Diana finally woke up and answered, There were a dozen between us and I've already eaten my share. Smiling, John grabbed one of the donuts and let it melt in his mouth. This will tide me over until we have breakfast at Virginia's diner. What do you think of their country ham and cookies and cream? Diana shook her head. I'm not dressed to go to Virginia's diner. John was confused. Diana, there is no dress code at the Virginia diner. You can wear whatever you want there. Diana smiled. I know that you can wear almost anything, but you can't not wear almost anything. After she finished speaking, she opened her coat to show John a purple lingerie set. Well, it's almost nothing. John agreed. Is the coat new? Diana replied. Yes, I exchanged my dress for this magnificent coat. In case you didn't check out the Victoria's Secret bag, I returned those other lingerie items and bought these items especially for you. Diana put her hand on his chin and lifted his head so that he looked into her eyes. This outfit and the body underneath are meant for your eyes and your eyes only for all the days and nights of our lives. After a short pause, she continued, I'm sorry for the hell I've put you through these past months. You were right about almost everything. There were only two things you were wrong about. Last night I got dressed for you and no one else, and I actually met Janice and Lisa. The second thing you were wrong about was that, when we had sex, I had sex with David. David never came into our bedroom. I didn't close my eyes to think about him, but I couldn't look you in the eyes because I was so ashamed of what I wanted to do. I'm ashamed to admit that the shame I felt didn't stop me from planning to be with him. She looked at him and said quietly, Now I really understand. He kissed her. They had a lot to talk about. 
They had a lot of work ahead of them to repair their marriage, but his heart leapt with joy when he realized that she finally understood. As John drove past the Virginia diner, he looked at Diana. She fell asleep again soon after they reached the highway. He remembered everything he did on Friday. They had a lot to talk about, and he knew that any honest conversation had to include his confession. John remembered that evening seven years ago. He was in San Francisco for the quarterly corporate meeting. At that time, he was the head of the department, and his adventure brought huge results to the company. Foreign companies were buying up their American competitors, but John saw an interesting opportunity. He advocated the idea of buying an Italian company with excellent engineers but serious financial problems. His mentor, the CEO, approved the purchase, and it was a great success. The purchase brought them several teams of experienced engineers. The big plus was the access to the European market that this company provided to the rest of the corporation and the strong presence of the Italian company in the Chinese market. The deal ultimately brought in billions of dollars. This was the crowning achievement of the CEO's career and set John on the fast track to a corporate career. That evening, Diana was home in Virginia with the boys at a school band concert, so John celebrated his success with his colleagues and especially with Debbie Maris, a wonderful marketing representative from another division. Debbie and he had a long-term business relationship of the friendly flirtation type. He drank just enough to ease his inhibitions, but not enough to lower his libido. They danced much closer than a married man should with someone other than his wife. They headed to her room. They kissed in the elevator. She started taking off her blouse. The elevator door opened and they quickly walked up to her room. He watched as she unzipped her skirt and, standing naked in the open doorway, reached for his hand. But John couldn't move. He realized that it was physically impossible for him to enter this room. The excitement is gone. For the first time in Hoor's, he thought about his wife and the wonderful family he had at home. He looked at the beautiful Debbie Maris and could not think of a single reason to enter the room. He took two steps back and then ran, literally ran, back to the elevator. He went into his room and took a shower, wanting to get rid of Debbie's smell. It was one in the morning in their house in Richmond, but he called Diana. He needed to hear her voice. After several rings, she sleepily picked up the phone. John assured Diana that he was fine and nothing bad had happened, and then told her the good news. He told her about the success of his adventure and his promotion with a huge increase in salary. He cried as she excitedly told him how proud she was of him and how she always knew he would succeed. She told him how much she loved him. Through his tears, he realized that he had almost shared one of the greatest moments of his life with the wrong woman. Diana's opinion and happiness were all that mattered to him. When John drove to the beach, he knew he had to tell her. He had to make her understand why he truly understood her feelings. He was in her shoes. And that is why he could listen to her and honestly say, I understand. David Summers sat alone in Fred Davis's office at Richards & Sons. Fred was the vice president of human resources and David was sent to his office as soon as he walked in that Monday morning. He didn't understand why he was here. Okay, he'd recently missed a couple of deadlines in his pursuit of Diana, but he felt like he could catch up quickly. The meeting confused his plans for this morning. He needed to talk to Diana about what happened over the weekend. Not only did she set him up, but she also sent two of her friends, Janice and Lisa, to tell him about it. David remembered how afraid he was of this woman, Lisa, his father served in the Navy for 25 years, but he couldn't hold a candle to the way this woman could swear. She embarrassed him right there in the lobby of the Jefferson Hotel. He recalled that even the hotel security seemed afraid to interfere. As he turned to return to his seat, he froze when he saw the photograph on Fred Davis's desk. It was a family portrait of Fred, his three sons, and his smiling wife. Now he knew the name of the woman who had scolded him so thoroughly, Lisa Davis. Now he understood why he was here. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.